Hello, this is Neil Buchanan with Rock Our World. I'm going to do another thing, again, uh, something I've done not done in the past. I'm going to give you a, a short review on a book. But before I do that, I want to go over again two translations that I have recommended uh, a few times in, in various ways to the listeners, to believers. Uh, one of the most uh, the most important thing we can do in our walk is to actually study the scriptures to read the scriptures and study them and and ask the holy spirit to explain them to you uh, that would when i say that's the most important thing that of equal importance is to ask jesus our lord into your heart and begin a walk where he's in your heart and guiding you and where the Holy Spirit is teaching you things. So anyway, the uh, the importance of the scriptures is uh, very high on the list. And uh, I'm going to, I did this the last episode, but I'll do it again. Show you this translation of what we call the Old Testament. It's actually the Torah, the prophets and the writings. And then I'll show you the back here, the Jewish Publication Society. They have gone to great lengths to make as accurate uh, a translation as possible, and they've they've come clean with with uh, the concept that uh, a great deal of idioms are used in the Hebrew text, and the majority of those idioms we do not know what they mean. Uh, they can be translated into English easily enough, but they mean something besides what they literally translate in into. Uh, I used the example in an older episode going way back of the term uh, that thing is heading south. You know, that's a, uh, I don't know how widespread this is in our Western world, but up here in Canada, we, uh, virtually everybody knows what it means when you say, well, that's going south. It means it's going bad. It's, it's going from bad to worse, and it's not good. It's not good at all. Whatever's going on is bad. That's what going south means, whereas to translate that literally, if a person came from a different country that didn't know anything about that idiom, they would have no idea what you're talking about. They would think you're, had to, you're getting a compass and you're finding the big S on it and you're heading south. And uh, the two have nothing to do with each other. So that's, the, that's an example of an idiom. And uh, the Hebrew language is full of idioms. And... As yet, we don't know what a lot of them mean. So anyway, this this uh, translation I just showed you, they're they're honest. They they'll say at the bottom of the page, it's uncertain what this Hebrew idiom means. And uh, in the course of time, God will restore the understanding of all these idioms. And some are known already. So and every time uh, the Hebrew scholars go through the original or the old text, like the ancient manuscripts. They understand more than the last time they did, and that's why it's important to keep at this. And this translation was done in the year 2000. It's, as far as we know, the most modern one. And I encourage all believers to join with uh, my wife and I and, and uh, other believers in prayers that the Lord will, will uh, stir up uh, the undertaking of a, a new translation. Here it is, 2016, and we know lots more than we did in the year 2000. So uh, now the second book is what Christians call the, the New Testament. And in fact, it says right on here, Aramaic, English, New Testament. Uh, until recently, it wasn't very well known that, the, that what we call the New Testament is really the, my wife used this phrase, the inspired commentary, uh, was written in Aramaic, not Greek. That was a lie. And that's been well guarded. And even though it came into light 30 years ago, it's still well guarded. The very few believers know that uh, the, the manuscripts, the original manuscripts written, uh, the, the letters and the diff different documents, the Gospels and so on, the Book of Acts, are all written in Aramaic, not Greek. And that the translation in the Greek was not done very well. Uh, and in many cases, it was done dishonestly. It, it didn't trans, 
uh, it didn't translate properly. They knew it wasn't. At any rate, these things have come to light, and this uh, author, Roth, uh, I, I've said this a number of times, it's not a very good translation, but it's the only one we have, uh, that tried to be uh, honest with and tried to convey what was actually written in the original Aramaic. What he used is a 1921 uh, translation, and then he went ahead and, uh, as many messianics do, I, I get after them. I've got after them quite a few times on this uh, YouTube channel, but they uh, do goofy things. They've uh, gone back to all the original Hebrewization, uh, Hebrewisms, uh, uh, how do you say this? Uh, they transliterated uh, names and words, and the, that whole translation is full of words you won't recognize if all you've ever read was uh, typical Christian translations and literature. Um, that, that was not necessary to do that, and I would very much like to see someone redo that uh, from the Aramaic and not change words and phrases and things that just aren't necessary. Where English people write things in English, don't transliterate the Hebrew. Uh, so uh, I've said this before, the only two words out of the thousands they did in this, this book uh, that I would personally use the, the Hebrew transliteration is the word Yeshua, which is the, probably the correct name for Jesus Christ, and the word uh, Torah, which is a uh, the, how you would it would likely sound in Hebrew if you said uh, the word that is often mistranslated as the law of God. It's the it's the Torah of the Lord, and it means the instructions and teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. So took quite a bit of time going over that again, but uh, it's really really important that we have uh, as accurate as we can get and that we take time to study these things, and that we take time to pray that the Lord will provide us with a, a more modern translation of the Hebrew texts, uh, the ancient texts. We know more and more about Hebrew, so we could do a better job in 2016, 2017, coming up. And uh, also, we can do better than a 1911 translation, no, 1921, I think it was, of the of the Aramaic uh, original Aramaic New Testament text, we can do much better and do a much better job of not making it even more complicated. Another thing I would like to see is you know, when we make English copies of this to to uh, write them uh, front front to back the way English would do it. I would, I'm all for making it as easy and user friendly as possible. This uh, when I showed you uh, the Tanakh, the, the Jewish Publication Society, they they wrote it in English, but they made it. They wrote it all backwards, uh, the way we would say uh, the Hebrew is backwards to English. That's why they did it. But they wouldn't have had to. They can write it forwards, just like they did with uh, Aramaic. I expect it's the same, but they chose to write it from uh, left to right. And uh, anyway. You get a hold of those if, if you have a bit of spare cash. And uh, join with me in prayers that we'll get a more recent and a more accurate one. Uh, so the last uh, thing I want to tackle on this episode is this book. I'm going to give a book review. Let's say, Man Rules But God Overrules. And it's written by Karen... Can you read that? I'll read it. Karen Fraser Romero. Now, this gal, I'll, I'll try and do a real quick synopsis of the book. I actually sped read through it. I've read a lot of similar things. I, uh, I tend to, a lot of people would call it conspiracy theorist. Uh, theorists. Uh, my my brother-in-law really gets into this, so I've heard tons of this stuff. 
uh, but I've never seen it all compiled together in one book. And I don't, I don't believe, I don't believe that they're wrong. I, I, I accept that there's theory, there's conspiracies out there. And uh, uh, the thing is, what do we do with them? Do we dwell on them and get all scared about them and that Satan's going to win the war? No, God, just like this book says, men come up with ideas and they rule, but God overrules them. He changes their plans and he causes it to work out the way he intends it to work out. And he always did intend it to work out. So anyway, in this book, they dwell on a, a particularly on, uh, they really beat up the Catholic Church. And I want to caution people not to do that. Uh, what what this Karen is pointing out, and she's done tons of research, and she's got lots of background and supporting uh, information, and I, I don't doubt that it's correct, and I, and I don't worry about it, whether it's correct or not. It may be useful as the last days unfold to know what's behind some of these things, but it, at, in, the end, in the end of the of the story, it's not going to change the outcome. God is going to win, and God is looking for his bride right now. And uh, whether or not these secret societies are doing nasty things won't change any of those things. It won't change our our quest to uh, seek out uh, our Lord and to uh, do what he wants us to do and learn to hear his voice and do his work on the face of this earth. Of His work entails... Uh, uh, four things to uh, to preach the kingdom, the coming of the kingdom, to uh, make disciples, to cast out demons, and to uh, heal the sick. Those are the four things that Jesus tells us to do. You read through the Gospels, and he gives us the power and authority to do those things. And whether there's uh, secret societies working behind the scenes, uh, won't won't affect that. Uh, at any rate, I can't see that knowing these things harms either. Just uh, might be useful to have a heads up. So, uh, and we don't want to beat up the Catholic Church. It proclaims here in this book that uh, the secret societies, you may know some of them, or maybe you know all of them. The, uh, you know, it starts with the Freemasonry secret society. Uh, the Knights of the Tem Knights Templar, the uh, Knights of Columbus, in a little more recently, which is connected with the Catholic Church. The uh, more most recent that uh, that I don't didn't know about are the Knights of Malta, and then uh, the really big thing that I had never heard of before was the role of the Jesuits. In all this, that they're, in fact, uh, as she describes, well, this is a fact according to her, right? And I don't believe it or mis misbelieve it, unbelieve it. <laughs> How would you say that? Disbelieve it. Uh, I just say that it, it may matter to some small degree as the future unfolds, but it won't change uh, what God's doing with us and what our job right now is is to be, and. Uh, at any rate, this uh, book proclaims that the, the Pope is and always has been uh, the, the political leader in the forefront of uh, a society or a group of people that want to take over the world and, and promote a one-world government, one-world religion, and this kind of thing. And that... Uh, the behind-the-scenes guy is the J Jesuit general. I think they had a name for it. But uh, one of the nicknames is he's the black pope, and the, the guy that is seen in the, in the cameras is the white pope. And that they work with each other, but that the, the one behind the scenes, the, the general, Jesuit general, is the, or the black pope is, has the power. But we don't know, generally don't know who he is or where he's operating and so on, and that these Jesuits is a secret society that's full intent is to destabilize the world in any way, shape, or form that they can, and stir up wars and contention and evil and all kinds of things so that 
the society in general worldwide will uh, eventually clamor for a one world government to bring stability back and that is the full intent from the beginning so anyway that's kind of a short summary of where she's going and what she's coming from the mistake I don't want anybody to make is to show, associate whether or not the Pope is actually doing this and the Jesuits are are doing this or not doing this uh, and I don't have any book I don't have any trouble believing they are it doesn't change that the the Catholic Church in the corner is part of this evil in fact all of these secret societies operate the same way they uh, they attract in usually it's men but uh, just made me think of the Eastern Star that was uh, kind of the the women's arm of the what would be the sort of like the Knights of Columbus there were other names for these secret societies and uh, at any rate the people join and they think it's just a club you know you something to do something to fellowship and socialize with people and they by and large believe that they're worshiping God like they have things about God and they give allegiances to God well it, it turns out in virtually all of these secret societies if you read all their literature right in the deep dark corners they're actually worshiping the God of this world that is Satan the devil and it is not uh, the God who created the world but the God of this world so the God who created this world he is Jesus Christ and his father is the is the God the Father and and these secret societies in general keep this hidden from the vast majority of their followers and uh, nobody knows really what's going on until you get near the top levels and there's just very few people that work their way up there and they're drawn in by and large by power and money uh, the, which are the two biggest lusts of of human beings uh, to have power and to have money and Satan uh, in, uh, tempts them with this and draws these few people up to the top echelons of these secret societies and they really are doing evil things and they really are desirous to take over the the world in a one world government and a, and a uh, one world religion a one world police system and of course it really boils down to tyranny and uh, that there is uh, complete control. Nonetheless, this is all fear stuff, and God is constantly thwarts what they try to do, and uh, there will, by the look of the book of Revelation, eventually they will succeed, and there will be one world government. And that's described in the ten toes in the, in the uh, statue that Daniel saw, the vision he had, and it's alluded to in the book of Revelation, the coming together of ten groups of nations in a one world government, the last attempt to uh, uh, get control of the chaos that's going on. But uh, they will, for the very last time, be thwarted when Jesus Christ returns and destroys the Babylon and this, this final attempt to take over the world in a one world government and uh, Jesus is the victor. So not to worry too much about all these uh, uh, secret societies and the bank is highly involved in this too. The banks are very evil in that uh, between the banks and a few wealthy families in the world they gather the entire wealth of the entire planet, planet Earth, into one one or a few huge pots, trillions and trillions of dollars are being stolen from the, the general public, from you and I, and uh, the process is bankrupting the countries of the world and, and this destabilization will eventually work, uh, but, or appear to work. And that's where Jesus Christ uh, returns and stops it all and sets everything up straight and uh, so anyway, I, I think I covered the, uh, that is a very short review of this book.
And I strongly encourage people, if they do read it, don't assume then that the Catholic Church is evil. The, the 99% of the people who call themselves Catholics are good people. I know lots of them, and they uh, fear God, and they, uh, they worship God in their churches. And uh, there's questionable things in their past, but they, they have corrected them. And there's questionable things in the past of all religions. Uh, so uh, that's my caution. If you're going to read this book, it might be useful sometime in the future when uh, this chaos escalates in the world, but it still won't change that 99% uh, of the people who call themselves Catholics are good people, and they have the same challenge as the rest of us to read the scriptures and come in line with what God teaches, not what it, any church teaches or any man or any man, whether it's the Pope or uh, or the leader of any particular religion or any political person, uh, or any uh, evangelist for that matter. It's uh, our responsibility to read, study the scriptures, to ask the Holy Spirit to explain it to us, and then go out and do what Jesus tells us to. And we've, I've covered all those things. So I will sign out. This is Neil Buchanan with Rock Our World.